Hello, welcome back. We are on the very last segment of this series that we've been on, The Ministries of the Holy Spirit by Dr. Arnold Freitenbaum. And today we're going to look at the national regeneration of Israel. And then we'll also look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the millennium. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. I just thank you for this study, for the hours that Dr. Freitenbaum poured into studying your word, bearing out the points that we have learned. I just pray that they will remain with us. And Father, for all of those who are sick, I pray for your healing touch to be upon them today. I thank you for your great mercy and your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so we're gonna look at the second major future work of the Holy Spirit, and that's gonna be Israel's national regeneration. The national regeneration of Israel is consistently connected with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it's seen in a number of passages in the Old Testament. So if you have your Bible, if you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 32, we're going to read several verses. Um, now, the first passage is that we're going to read is going to be verses 9 through 14 of chapter 32. And that says, rise up, you women who are carefree. And hear my voice, you confident and unsuspecting daughters. Listen to what I am saying. In little more than a year, you will tremble with anxiety, you unsuspecting and complacent women. For the vintage has ended and the harvest will not come. Tremble, you women who are carefree. Tremble with fear, you complacent ones. Now, he is describing the period of the great tribulation in, these, in this particular segment. He says, strip, undress, and wear sackcloth on your waist in grief. Beat your breast in mourning for the beautiful fields for the fruitful vine, for the land of my people growing over with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all the houses of joy in the joyous city, for the palace has been abandoned and the populated city has been deserted. The hill of the city and the watchtower have become caves for wild animals forever, a delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks, so that's a pretty drastic situation that's happening. And it's going to be a very drastic situation in Israel during the tribulation period. Now that's a seven year period. It's the last of the um, Daniel seven sevens. And so we see that God pressed pause. And now we are in this dispensation of grace, the church age, but he will unpress pause and that last week, which is a period of seven years in Jewish reckoning, will be the tribulation broken up, divided in half by three and a half years in the first and three and a half years in the second. Now, it is not, um, it is not a, according to our calendar, the solar calendar, it's based on the lunar calendar, which has 360 days. So, when you go, if you go to ever add that up, be mindful of that, that it is based on the Jewish lunar calendar. All right. Now, then you have the second segment, which is in verse 15. It says, until the spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fertile field and the fertile field is valued as a forest. OK, that describes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then in this verse, Isaiah speaks of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Israel following the great tribulation. Now, the first half, that three and a half years, is the Lamb's wrath. And the last half is the great tribulation. That is when God's full fury is poured out on this world. So that will be at the closing of the tribulation. Now, we see here that he says, in the third segment, which is verses 16 through 20, he describes the Messianic kingdom, which follows the national regeneration of Israel. So let's look at those quickly. All right. Verse 16 of Isaiah chapter 32 through 20. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will live in the fertile field. Well, those two key words right there, justice and righteousness. I want you to pay close attention to those because right now in 2022, Justice is far away, and so is righteousness. Isaiah speaks of these two terms repeatedly in the book of Isaiah. He says in verse 17, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness will be quietness 
in confident trust forever. Because you know something, when you're living in an unrighteous land, can you be confident? Can you, can you feel secure? No, you can't. Verse 18, then my people will live in a peaceful surrounding and in secure dwellings and in undisturbed resting places. But it will hail when the forest comes down and the capital city will fall in utter humiliation. Blessed, that means happy, fortunate, are you who cast your seed upon all waters. Now, that's when the river overflows its banks and irrigates the land. You who allow the ox and the donkey to roam freely. So he's, he's showing you the regeneration of Israel, what it will be. But the prior verses 9 through 14, that's a bleak. That's very, very bleak. But then you see that justice and righteousness will be restored in the Messianic kingdom. Okay, so now let's go to Isaiah chapter 44. Flip over, if you will. And we're going to look at chapter 44, verses 1 through 5. It says, But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you, says, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and you sure in Israel, the upright one, whom I have chosen, for I will pour out water on him who is thirsty and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like willows by the streams of water. One will say, I am the Lord's, and another will name himself after Jacob. Another will write on his hand, I am the Lord's, and be called the honorable name of Israel. Okay, so verses one through two emphasize that Israel is the chosen people. Now, they were chosen when God cut a covenant with them, okay, on Mount Sinai. He called them out of Egypt, led them under Moses, brought them to through the wilderness into Mount Sinai. And when Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, he cut covenant. Israel was his holy beloved people, his covenant people. That's why he calls them my people. Well, now under the covenant of grace that Jesus Christ cut for us on the cross, we too, Gentiles, are in covenant with him. We are his people. He is ours and we are his. We abide in him. He abides in us. He put his spirit, the Holy Spirit, within us to dwell forever. So we see that verses one through two emphasize that Israel is the chosen people of God. And verses three through five describe the outpouring of the spirit upon the whole entire nation of Israel. Then, if you'll flip over to the book of Ezekiel, we're going to look at the 39th chapter and we're going to look at verses 25 through 29. And it says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. I will be jealous for my holy name, meaning demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine. They will forget their disgrace and all their treachery because what did Israel do? They committed idolatry. They turned away from the Lord. Well, that's a warning to us in America, isn't it? We are following in the footsteps of ancient Israel. All right. He says they will forget their disgrace and all their treachery, which they perpetuated against me when they live securely in their own land. And there is no one who makes them afraid. And right now, what do they have constantly? They have threats and attacks from neighboring countries, terrorists, a, a term that we've had to live with. I have most of my, well, all of my adult life and, and a good part of my childhood, terrorism. Verse 27, when I bring them back from the nations and gather them out of their enemies' lands, then I shall show myself holy, God says. And my justice and holiness will be vindicated through them in the sight of many nations. Now, verse 28, then they will know without any doubt that I am the Lord, their God. Now, that terminology was used when he was cutting covenant. Okay, so he brings it back and he puts it in there so that they will recall that covenant. He says, I am the Lord, their God, because I made them go into exile among the nations. What happened? Well, he's going to scatter. He scattered them. He did in Ezekiel. All right. It hadn't happened at that time, but he scattered them and they dispersed. They went to the four corners of the world. They did not dwell on their own land. Now, we know that in 1948, they came back together as a nation, 
as prophesied in Ezekiel. Read Ezekiel 37 and 38. You'll see in 37, the Valley of the Dry Bones, and then you'll see 38, the War of Gog and Magog. Now, he says, because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gather them to their own land, I will leave none of them there among the nations any longer. So he's going to bring them all back into the land which he gave to Abraham. I will not hide my face from them any longer because I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. Now, most Jews are Orthodox, meaning they do not believe in Jesus Christ as Messiah. Okay, Yeshua, as he's known in Hebrew, Messiah, Hamashiach. So they do not recognize him as that. Dr. Friedbaum is one of those Jewish men that read, studied, and saw Jesus as Messiah through the scriptures and accepted him as Lord and Savior. He is known as a Messianic or a Reformed Jew. Now, there are many, many Reformed or Messianic Jews, but all of the house of Israel shall be saved, God says. So in Ezekiel, in that passage that I read, we see verses 25 through 28 describe a worldwide regathering of the Jewish people for the Messianic kingdom. The basis, he says, for Israel's worldwide regathering is given in verse 29. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel. So they are going to know him. They will know that it is God himself. Okay, moving along. It says this verse speaks of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the whole nation of Israel, and it will result in Israel's regeneration, which in turn will be the basis for Israel's final restoration and regathering. So there it is. They will be fully restored. Now, if you go to the book of Joel, Joel's a minor prophet, but if you'll turn to chapter two, we're going to look at two verses there, 28 and 29. And the title of these two verses here in my Bible is the promise of the spirit. Remember that under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit was promised to us. So here he tells the Jewish people, he says, it shall come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. See, he was telling them then, he's including mankind universal, men, women, children, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. He was going to bring the Jews and the Gentiles together. The Jews would never have accepted that. They didn't see it at that time. They were spiritually blinded. But what did God do when he sent his son to the cross? He brought all mankind. He poured out his spirit. And all your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, those are in the latter days, the end days. But God was going to bring, and he says it, he was going to bring everyone together, give everyone the same opportunity to be in covenant with him, to be an adopted member of his family. He says that um, Joel is speaking about the last days of the great tribulation when the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon the whole nation of Israel. Peter quoted this passage in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21, only as an application to their experience, for there was a pouring out of the Spirit in a limited way, but only upon the 12 apostles. We've already looked at that, so I won't reference it there, but if you need that scripture reference again, it's Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. So only the 12 apostles at that time, or on the 120 at the most, but not on the whole nation of Israel. So it's for a limited number of people. He says the fulfillment of Joel chapter two, verses 28 through 29 did not occur in Acts two, nor is it occurring at the present time because we still have, like I've said, many Orthodox Jews. They have not seen Jesus as Messiah. He says here that um, it will only occur when the whole nation of Israel shall be saved. So, during the Great Tribulation, now, the next one I want you to look at is if you'll turn over a few uh, books to Zechariah, and Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Now, the title here I have in my Bible is The Golden Lampstand and the Olive Trees. It says, an angel 
let me make sure I'm, yeah, one through 14. And the angel who was speaking with me came back and awakened me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with this book, with this bowl for oil on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps, which are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and on the other is on the left. So I asked the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who was speaking with me answered and said, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this continuous supply of oil is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, who was prince of Judah, saying, not by my might, nor by power, but by my spirit, of whom the oil is a symbol, says the Lord of hosts. Now, have you ever looked into the names of God? Look into that when the Lord of hosts right there. Verse seven, what are you, O great mountains of obstacles, before Zerubbabel, who will rebuild the temple, you will become a plain, insignificant person. And he will bring out the capstone of the new temple with loud shouts of grace, grace to it. Also, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house and his hands will finish it. Then you will know, recognize, understand fully that the Lord of hosts has sent me as his messenger to you with, with who with reason despises the day of the small things. Now, our beginnings for the seven shall rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which roam throughout the earth. So the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth. And you see that in Revelation also in Revelation chapter five, verse six. And then I said to him who was speaking with me, what are these two olive trees on the right side of the lampstand on the left? And a second time I said to him, what are these two olive branches, which are beside the two golden pipes by which the golden oil is empty? And he answered, do you not know? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two sons of fresh oil, Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the prince of Judah, who were standing by the Lord of the whole earth as his anointed ones. And there you can see that also in Revelation in chapter 11, verse four. So. I have to tell you, the fifth passage here that we just read also pictures Israel as a saved nation. The universal outpouring of the Holy Spirit will be on the nation of Israel only, and it's connected with the Holy Spirit in verse six, which I just read. Now, if you'll flip over some, a few chapters to chapter 12, we're going to look at um, chapter 10, and we're going to go from chapter 10, I mean, verse 10 of chapter 12 through 13.1. Um, it says, I will pour out in the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look at me whom they've pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns as an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him as one who weeps bitterly over a firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of the city of Hadarimon in the Valley of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the royal family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan, David's son, by itself and their wives by themselves, the priestly family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei, the grandson of Levi, by itself and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain each by itself and their wives by themselves, each with an overwhelming individual regret for having blindly rejected their Messiah. Now, they will weep and they will mourn because they will see what they missed, but they shall be saved. They shall be saved. He says here in this passage, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit results in Israel's national regeneration, which in turn leads to the second coming of Jesus, the Messiah. They will see him, they will mourn, they will weep, and then, then we will have the second coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus is returned next, he returns in the clouds to collect the saints, born-again believers, 
who are followers of his. And I believe I'm a pre-trib person based on scripture that the church is called out, the ecclesia is called out, and we are not appointed unto wrath. There are several scriptures, and that's a teaching actually in and of itself, which we may look at next year. But for now, I don't believe the church will be here, the body of Christ. So you have the nation of Israel. God's going back to covenant that was cut in Genesis with Abraham. And God is dealing with the nation of Israel. And they will see, they will see their Messiah. They will mourn and they will weep, but they will accept and all the house of Israel will be saved. In this second major work, he says, and ministry of the Holy Spirit in the future, the Holy Spirit will work in such a way that the whole nation of Israel will be saved by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And it will in turn bring his second coming. So when he comes the next time for the rapture, that's for the body of Christ. But when he actually comes the second time to the earth, he touches the Mount of Olives and it splits in two. There will be a great earthquake. So looking to the millennium and in closing today, the third future ministry of the Holy Spirit will be his work in the millennium. And three main ministries, he says, should be mentioned. The first is the ministry of regeneration. There will be people born in the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. And these will continue to inherit the sin nature. That sin nature has to be regenerated through faith. Now, through the death, burial, and resurrection, okay, of the Messiah. So just as we right now, we have to be regenerated. We have to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for us, that he cut a covenant for us, that he was buried and that he was resurrected. He arose on the third day. He ascended to the father. He put his blood on the altar and that paid the penalty for all of our sins, past, present, and future. When we truly believe, the thing is, have you made a true profession? And if you haven't been baptized and you have the opportunity, be baptized. It is publicly identifying yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that we, and we do that because we love him, because we're obeying him. Now, the Holy Spirit will be generating people in the millennial kingdom, according to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And I won't go there right now, but the ministry of indwelling is going to be the second ministry. And he will indwell believers. You see that in Jeremiah 31, 33. And you see it also in the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, verses 27, and then Ezekiel 37, verse 14. And then the fullness of the Spirit rests upon the Messiah. That is the third ministry. By means of the Holy Spirit, the Messiah will exercise his authority and rule with the attributes described in Isaiah 11, verses 2 through 3. Let's go back to Isaiah and let's read that together. Um, Jeremiah is a book. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to 31 actually here in a second because I want to finish with that. That's why I skipped over it. But we're going to look here in chapter 11, verse, verses two and three. Okay. Of Isaiah. So we, um, we know that it says, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. What does the Holy Spirit do? And what have we learned? The Holy Spirit illuminates our eyes to understanding. You can't read the word of God, the Bible. You can't read it and understand it, interpret it, and correctly apply it, which is wisdom, without having the Holy Spirit within you. You can't. To, to the man, to the woman, to the child trying to read the Bible and understand it without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you can't. It seems absurd. And so when you hear people that have supposedly read the Bible and then they they want to contradict what God says, such as, well, those are just stories. Do, do you really believe those stories are real? You know something? As a born-again believer, truly saved, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, regenerated? Yes, I believe everything that's in this word. 
because it's the inerrant holy word of God. So we see next the counsel of strength. The spirit of counsel and strength. The spirit of knowledge and a reverential and obedient fear of the Lord. Fear doesn't mean terror of the Lord. It means respect, awe, reverence. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see. Nor make decisions by what his ears hear. You see, that's a, that's a perfect thing for all of us to remember in, in the whole totality of this lesson is you can't always believe what you see and you can't believe what you hear. Now, the Holy Spirit, if you're in a situation or you have something happen, you need to go to him. You need to pray. The Holy Spirit is actually praying for you without you even knowing it. We've learned that throughout the whole course of this. The Holy Spirit prays and intercedes for us as our paraclete, as our standby, our partaker. He enables us. He strengthens us. He gives us guidance and counsel and wisdom. He prays for us when we don't know what or how to pray. And he is constantly praying for us. Think about that. I'm not conscious of it all the time, but the Holy Spirit of God is praying for me. So, I mean, that is what gives me peace in this life. That's what gives me calm. That's, that's what gives me assurance that whenever a storm or a fire, whatever kind of tribulation comes my way, I know that God was already there. I know the Holy Spirit's already been praying. I know that what is required of me is obedience. Listen, pray, and obey. So here I want to go over to Jeremiah. I want to go back to Jeremiah chapter 31, and we're going to close out with that. Jeremiah chapter 31 is a beautiful, beautiful um, chapter because so much it's covenant. And he's speaking of a new covenant here, the covenant that you and I are under now. So let's go back to, all right, let me, um, I'm just going to go back to verse 27. I'm going to back up a little bit further. It says, behold, meaning listen carefully. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. It will be that as I have washed over them to uproot and to break down, to overthrow, destroy, and afflict with disaster. So I will watch over them to build and to plant with good, says the Lord. In those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone will die only for his own wickedness. Every man who eats sour grapes, his own teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, the Lord says, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, which is the northern kingdom, and with the house of Judah, which was the southern kingdom, because Israel divided. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. He was like a husband to them. He watched over them. He provided for them, cared for them. He rained manna down from heaven, quail, just as our hu husband, wives, is a covering for us. They are to provide. They are a covering. God was a husband to the nation of Israel. So that's the language which he's using there. Verse 33, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. Well, what did God do? He put his spirit within us. And that spirit leads us into all righteousness, doesn't it? We know when we're doing wrong. We, or you should know. If you're a true born again Christian, if your heart's never pricked or you're never convicted of wrongdoing, maybe you said something, maybe you did something. Let me tell you something. Check. Just check your heart. Examine yourself as the Bible says. Now, he says, I will put my law with them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. We Gentiles now are in the family of God. We are God's people. And each man will no longer teach his neighbor and his brother saying, know the Lord. Because you see, for so many years, they didn't have the scriptures like we did. People couldn't read, they couldn't write, and they depended on other people, the hearing of the word. We now have Bibles. 
many of us have multiple Bibles. We have multiple translate translations. We have multiple references and resources that we can use. And there's a plethora online. Just at the touch of a fingertip with a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, we have no excuse in this day and age, none whatsoever. So we will know the Lord, for they will all know me through personal experience, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will no longer remember their sin. Now, I tell you, that gives me hope. It gives me hope for the world in which I live in, for the ever-changing events, for globally looking at this world and the nations, the many nations that comprise this, this world that we live in, this planet we're living on. We're all down here stuck together. And I tell you something, we don't always know what one nation or another nation is going to do. I don't know what my nation's going to do, but I know one thing. I know what God's going to do because he tells us in his word and he put his Holy Spirit within us. So we have a lot as we come upon Thanksgiving next week. We have a lot to be thankful for that Jesus Christ is willing to come to this earth, wrap himself in flesh, live as a human although being fully God, the second person of the Trinity, and cut a covenant on a cross for you and I, so that the third divine majesty of the Trinity could come and live within us, the Holy Spirit. I thank you for joining me on this journey through the Holy Spirit, and the ministries, the work, the person. We began with R.A. Tory, and then we did a brief study on the Holy Trinity by Dr. Fruitenbaum, and we've now completed the ministries of the Holy Spirit by Dr. Arnold Fruitenbaum. All of this is on our YouTube channel, The Barnabas Project. And I just wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna thank you for your love for the Lord and, and just for joining us.